Red Brick Media. All quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawah work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا وسيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار It has been authentically narrated and reported in a number of our hadith from our Prophet and Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the number of heavens that Allah Azza wa Jal created are seven and the number of earths that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created are seven and that the distance between this earth and the first of those heavens is the distance of 500 years of travel and the distance between the first heaven and the second heaven is 500 years of travel. And the distance between the second heaven and the third heaven is 500 years of travel. And therefore between each every single two heavens, the distance between them is 500 years of travel. And above the seventh heaven, until the Arsh of Ar-Rahman, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is 500 years of travel. And above his throne, Above the throne of Allah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala high and raised above his throne. Mustawan ala arshih ba'inun an khalqih. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, bearing this in mind, ما يكون من نجوى ثلاثة إلا هو رابعهم ولا خمسة إلا هو سادسهم ولا أدنى من ذلك ولا أكثر إلا هو معهم أينما كانوا. There is not a single gathering or group of three people except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fourth amongst them. And there is not a group of five or six except that Allah azza wa jal is the sixth or seventh. And there is nothing or no number greater or less than this except that Allah azza wa jal is with them wherever they may be. And this means that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is present with his knowledge, that he is all hearing, all seeing, all knowing, knowing of that which we do. And this is important because the topic that we're going to discuss today is about Tawbah. And you can't really speak about repentance and forgiveness until you come to accept and learn that Allah Azza wa Jal first and foremost has all knowledge of each and every single thing we do. Even though He subhanahu wa ta'ala is so far above us, He knows each and every single thing that we do. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions in a very beautiful statement, he says, Rahimahullah, that man has been created with the ability to do good and evil. This is in our nature. We have the ability to do both good and evil. And the person or man has been, not been created, he hasn't been created as someone who is infallible, someone who can't make mistakes, someone who is like the angels. But Ibn al-Qayyim, Rahimahullah, mentions that if a person was to obey Allah and to do good, then in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would be more noble than the closest of angels to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet at the same time, and with the same token, if he was to do evil and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he would be worse in the sight of Allah than all of the animals. And this is, if you like, the scale of good and evil that Allah azza wa jal has placed for us. And you see this scale of good and evil and how it, if you like, how it is emphasized or how it becomes apparent amongst us is the level of taqwa that we have, the level of piety. 
how closely or how much we know and admit and show in our actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over us, that he sees us, that he knows that which we do, every single thing that we do. And this is why when you look at the lives of the companions radiallahu anhum and the great scholars of Islam alayhim rahmatullah, you will find that they would display this even before we get into the chapter of repentance and tawbah, even before we go into the sinning and the sins that each and every single one of us commits. The first and foremost thing that they would know and acknowledge is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches them, he sees them, he knows what they do. And this is why Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu narrates that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an during his khilafah and the amazing thing about Umar radiallahu anhu is that whenever you read his biography, whenever you read his life, you'll always come up with something new. Most of us sitting here today will have heard a number of lectures about the life of Umar. We probably read books about the life of Umar. And we probably think that we know everything that Umar did, everything that he said, and everything that we need to know about him. Yet every single time you hear a story about Umar, or every single time you hear another lecture about Umar, you will find that there is something new. Because this man, subhanAllah, was amazing. Allah Azza wa Jal gave him such tawfiq, such blessing, that he has so many amazing incidents within his life. So many things that you can take out. So many things that you will hear that you won't have heard of before about the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. Anas ibn Malik narrates that Umar radiallahu anhu was once in a garden from the gardens of the Ansar. And he was alone and there was no one with him. But Anas says that I was following him in order to see what he was going to do. And you will hear this coming over and over again, where the scholars and the companions used to follow one another secretly to see what they would do in seclusion. Because unlike us, the companions were better when they were alone than they were when they were with other people. With us, we're good when we're in public, when we're with others. But at home, we're evil. When we're alone, we don't do much good. Yet the companions were the opposite. At home, they were better than they were outside. And this is why Uthman radiallahu anhu said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu on his deathbed when he was thinking about appointing Umar as the Khalifa. Uthman was asked about his opinion and he said, I think that he is better inside than he shows us. What he has inside of him, what he does alone is better than that which he displays for us. Umar was thinking that he was alone. So he said, addressing himself, and this is also something that you will find that the scholars would often do they would speak to themselves out loud. And now if someone, if you hear someone talking to themselves, you know, we think he's crazy. He's got a few screws loose, he needs to go and seek some help. Yet the scholars would do this, and the companions would do this, and it was a way of them humbling themselves, a way of them showing humility. Umar radiallahu anhu is alone, there's no one around him. And he says, Umar amirul mu'mineen, wallahi latattaqiyanna Allah, Umar, this man who claims to be the Amirul Mu'mineen, the leader of the faithful, by Allah you will either fear Allah or Allah will punish you severely. And this is Umar speaking to himself, humbling himself, showing himself there's no one around him that he knows of, showing himself that he needs to realize that even in the station that he has, which is the most powerful station in the dunya, he is still in need of Allah Azza wa Jal and his help and he still needs to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another story about Umar radiallahu an, and again that amazing man Umar, an Arabi, a Bedouin comes to him, poor, hungry, without any food, without any clothing, one of the poorest of the people. He comes to Umar radiallahu an, and he says to him in beautiful poetry, he says, Ya Umar al Khairi Juzit al Jannah, Uksu Bunayaka wa Umma Hunna, Wa Kuluna fi the Zamani Junna, Uksimu Billahi letaf Alanna. He says to Umar the Allah Wanhu in poetry describing his need, describing how poor he is, how much in need he is. And he's asking Umar the Amir al Mu'minin, the leader of the believers. He says, Ya Umar al Khairi Juzit al Jannah, O Umar. The one who is good, may you be rewarded with paradise. I need clothing for my children and for their mother. 
and each one of us will have a time in which, in, in which he is in need. So I swear by Allah that you will help me. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he looks at him and he says, and what if I don't help you? What if I refuse to help you? He wants to see the response that he's going to gain. So the man says, إِذَنْ أَبَا حَقٍ لَأَمْضِيَنَّهِ he says again in poetry, then in that case I have no other choice except to go. If you say no to me and you refuse, there's nothing else that I can do. I will continue and I will move on. So then Umar radiallahu anhu says to him again, he asks him, so what if you move on? If you go and you leave, then what will happen? And so he replies again in poetry and he says, Wallahi anhunna latus'alunna yawm al yakunu يَوْمَ يَكُونُ الْأُعْطِيَاتُ مِنْهُنَّ وَمَوْقِفُ الْمَسْؤُولِ بَيْنَهُنَّ إِمَّا إِلَى نَارٍ وَإِمَّا إِلَى جَنَّةٍ That if I leave now, today, I swear by Allah that a day will come that you will be asked about this. And on that day, you will not be the one who will give to people. You won't be the one who is in charge and who is giving out to people. And the one who has responsibility, his station on that day will either be between paradise or the fire. He will either go to one or the other. And so Umar radiallahu anhu began to cry. And he began to cry at this so much that he was amazed by the response of this man. And he's an Arabi, a Bedouin. And normally when in a hadith or when in Islam and we say it's a Bedouin, he's someone who's illiterate. He doesn't know much about Islam. He wasn't a companion or someone that lived in Medina that the people knew him by his name. He was a person who came from the desert. Yet his response was so powerful that he made Umar radiallahu anhu cry. So Umar radiallahu anhu went into his own house to look for something that he could give. And he found nothing. Because even though he's the leader of the Muslims, he has nothing to give. So he comes out to the man and he takes, up his, takes off his top sheet his top robe that he's wearing. And he gives it to the man. And he says, take this for that day on which I will be asked. And for that day that others will give to me. And for that day that I will have to stand and I will either be taken to paradise or the fire. And then he gives him that which he was wearing. And he says, I have nothing else. Another great Umar radiallahu an, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz alayhi rahmatullah, one of the other great Umars in Islam, once when he was distributing the war booty of the Muslims, he found that one of his children was playing nearby. And the child came and he took an apple from the booty of the Muslims, an apple, and he put it into his mouth. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah saw that. And he went up to him and he took it from his mouth and he placed it back. So the child began to cry. And he went running home to his mother Fatima. And Fatima asked the child, why are you crying? And the boy told her what happened. So Fatima gave from her own money one of her slaves. He, she gave him some money and she said, go and buy the child an apple. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz returned after distributing the war beauty. And he came into his house and he could smell the scent of an apple. So he said to his wife, where did you get this apple from? I swear by Allah that I didn't take anything from the booty of the Muslims. And so his wife told him, she said, your son came crying and he wanted an apple, so I bought him an apple. And so he said, by Allah, I swear by Allah, that when I took that apple from his mouth, it was like I was taking something out of my own heart. But I swear by Allah that I don't want to face Allah and my destruction is because of an apple that I didn't give to its due right, to the person that had a right to it. Over an apple, I didn't want to destroy myself. And this is something, subhanAllah, that you see over and over again. It's reported that the wives of the Salaf, alayhim rahmatullah, the wives of the Salaf, when they would go out to work, their wives would say to them, fear Allah, fear Allah, and make sure that you don't bring anything into this house except that which is halal, because tomorrow you will have to account for it. SubhanAllah, this is the wife of the Salaf, or one of the wives of the Salaf. How often do we have this same type of consciousness of Allah? How often do we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like this? Where we advise one another, a husband to the wife, a wife to the husband, and so on and so forth, that fear Allah by Allah, don't bring anything into this house except that which is halal. At the same time, you will find that there were others from amongst the salaf 
that when they wanted to get married, even after they got married, they would want to test one another to see their level of taqwa, to see how, how good they were in their worship of Allah. Because like I said, outside it's one display, but inside it's completely different. It was reported from Iyas al-Qaisi, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the scholars of Islam, that after he got married, for the first day and the first night, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything which was an act of worship. But rather he wanted to see whether his wife would pick up on this. Whether she would see this and she would advise him because he wasn't doing anything good. Or whether she would accept this. So as to see what her true reality was as well. So during the day she was working and he was doing nothing. And he said to her, why are you only baking bread today? So she said, I am doing it because it is my responsibility. It is something which I need to do, it is one of my duties. And then after the night, when the night came, he wanted to sleep. So he pretended to go to sleep. And his, he found his wife stood up at the beginning of the night, the first quarter of the night. And so she said to him, Oh Iyas, why don't you pray? And he said, No, I will pray later. And then he pretended to sleep. And then in the second quarter of the night, she said to him again, Oh Iyas, why don't you stand and pray? And so he said, No, I don't need to pray, I will sleep and I will pray later. And then in the last third of the night, she said to him, Oh Iyas, why don't you pray? And he said, I'm too tired this night, I won't pray. So she said, speaking to him, May Allah curse the one who deceived me about you. May Allah curse the one who deceived me about you. I thought you were better than this. She's saying that I thought you were someone who was knowledgeable, someone who was pious. May Allah curse the one who deceived me about you. This is reported from one of the other scholars of the Salaf. And subhanAllah, look at this. The, the situation of how people were conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in order for a person to make tawbah, to repent to Allah, to seek forgiveness from Allah, they have to be conscious of Allah. There has to be a level of taqwa, of piety there. Because if a person doesn't fear Allah, He's not conscious of Allah, he has no taqwa of Allah, then why will he go and make tawbah? And this is why we see that the Salaf would employ this with their wives, with themselves, with their children. As reported from amongst one of them. One of the scholars of the Salaf that he wanted to pray one night. So he stood up in the last third of the night and he was about to begin the prayer. Tahajjud, Qiyamul Layl. And his young child, his young son came and stood next to him. Young son, very young not yet reaching the age of maturity, six, seven years old. He came and he stood next to him. So the father, looking at his child with a look of love and affection and kindness, he said to him, what are you doing? So he said, I want to pray with you this night. So he said to him, you don't need to pray. You haven't reached that age where you need to pray. Go back to sleep. So the son said, no, I want to pray. He insisted on praying. So his father again trying to say to him in a nice way, he said, the prayer that I am going to do now is going to be very long. You will pray with me during the day. The night prayer is too long for you, go back to sleep. So he said to him, oh my father, why do you prevent me from praying? I want to pray and you say to me, don't pray. So he said to him, my son, this is something which is too difficult for you. I am aware of what is going on. You are too young for this. So why don't you go to sleep and you can do this some other time. He's trying to make an excuse for him so that he will go and sleep. So the child, six, seven years old, but already iman and taqwa is in his heart. He says, oh my father, indeed I see, from that which I see, is that when my mother comes and she begins to light a fire, she begins with the small pieces of wood before she begins with the big pieces of wood. And I fear that on yawmul qiyamah, Allah azza wa jal will begin with the small ones before he begins with the big ones. That it will be the young who will enter the fire before it will be those who are older who will enter the fire. So I want to begin to pray now, from now. Subhanallah, look at this. A child who's not even obligated to pray has this level of taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something which we find in our religion. That one thing that we each know, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated, Kullu bani adama khatta. وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ Each and every single son of Adam, each and every single person makes mistakes, sins. 
But the best of those who sin are those who often turn in repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us that Allah azza wa jal has 100 types of mercy or 100 parts of mercy and he revealed a single one of them to this earth. One part of a of hundred has descended to this earth and 99 are with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And due to that one part of mercy that has come to this earth, the animal does not tread on its own child. Due to that one part of mercy. But on Yawm al Qiyamah, that one mercy will ascend back and it will meet those other 99 to become 100. And in some narrations, it is even mentioned that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be so immense on that day on Yawm al Qiyamah that even Iblis will have hope. Even Iblis, who has been abolished to the fire and he has no hope, even though he will see the vast mercy of Allah on that day, and even he will have a glimmer of hope. Even he will think, maybe Allah will forgive me. Yet there are always two sides to the coin. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, inform my slaves that I am the one who is oft forgiving most merciful, but also inform them that my punishment is the most severe and painful of punishments. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a beautiful hadith he mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, when he was once sitting with some of his companions, and he saw a woman coming out looking for her child. She had lost him. So she would go around looking at the children. When she would see a child with his back to her, she would go and turn him around, searching for her child, until finally she finds her child. And so she picks him up and she takes him and places, her, places him on her chest, hugs him tightly. And the companions are watching this. And so the Prophet wasallam he asks them and he says, do you think that this woman would ever throw her child into the fire of hell? Do you think she would ever willingly go and cast her child into the fire of hell? So they said, no, O Messenger of Allah, she will never do so. So he replied and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lallahu Arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has more mercy to his slaves than this one to her child. Allah Azza wa Jal is more merciful than this one to her child. So uh, every single person will make a mistake. Kulluna dawu khata. Every single person will make a mistake. Yet what differentiates those who are believers from those who are not believers is the element of tawbah. That they return to Allah and they repent to Allah. And that's why the scholars mention that those who truly fear Allah, when they commit a single sin, for them it is like a mountain about to fall on top of them. They consider that one sin to be like a mountain that is about to crumble on top of their heads. Whereas those who don't have true Iman or have weak Iman, those who don't have fear of Allah or have weak Taqwa, when they commit sins, they consider it to be like a fly which they squat from their nose. This is what they consider their sins to be. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that if you were to not sin and disobey Allah, then Allah Azza wa Jal would do away with all of you. He would destroy all of you. And then he would bring a people that would sin and then they would seek the forgiveness of Allah so that Allah Azza wa Jal could forgive them. Each and every single person sins. Yet the difference between those who will have success and those who will be doomed to failure is whether they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullahu ta'ala mentions a story in one of his works about the children of Bani Israel at the time of Musa alayhi salam. And the people at that time, the children of Israel, were suffering from a drought. And it was a severe drought. And there was no rain. So they came to Musa alayhi salam and they said to him, O oh Musa, make dua to Allah that Allah azza wa jal sends rain upon us. So Musa gathered the children of Israel, Bani Israel. And in some narrations, there were over 70,000 of them. 70,000. And so they stood in one plain, they went out to the desert and they stood on a plain and then Musa made dua for rain. Yet no rain came. 
He made dua, yet nothing happened. And so Musa alayhi salam said, Oh Allah, I asked you for rain, yet you have not responded to me. So revelation came to him, and he was told that indeed from amongst those 70,000, those 70,000 people from Bani Israel, there is a man who has been sinning for over 40 years. And it is because of that one individual that Allah Azza wa Jal will not allow the rain to descend upon you. Subhanallah. Because of one individual and his sins, not only is he punished, not only is he deprived of blessing, but the whole community, the whole society, tens of thousands of people are also prevented from the blessings of Allah. So, revelation came to Musa and he was told to announce to Bani Israel that indeed there is a man from amongst you who has sinned against Allah for over 40 years and no rain will descend upon you until that man leaves you, until he goes out from amongst the 70,000 and he leaves you. And so Musa alayhi salam stood and he made this announcement and he told the people this. And so the people were looking at one another. Who is this man going to be that's going to leave? Who is he going to be? And so the man who was the one who had sinned for over 40 years, sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He looked right and he looked left. He knew that it was him, but he was hoping that maybe it was someone else that would leave. Yet when he saw no one leaving, he thought to himself, that I only have two options. Either I leave in front of everyone, and then I will be humiliated. I will be finished. No one will ever look at me again. Or I can stay and hide, but then I will also be destroyed because no rain will come, and along with me, the 70,000 will also be destroyed. So he lowered his head, and on that spot, he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Oh Allah, for 40 years you have concealed my sins. For 40 years you have kept me a secret. No one knows about me. You have kept me a secret. So now, O oh Allah, I repent to you and do not expose me on this day. And so as soon as he finished saying that, the rain began to descend. And so Musa alayhi salam, he said, O oh Allah, no one left from amongst us. Not a single man moved, yet the rain has come. And so Allah azza wa jal responded and he replied, then indeed it was because of that same individual Due to him, you were prevented from rain, and due to him, you have been granted rain. Subhanallah. That same person, because of him, no rain would come. But when he repented and returned to Allah, then rain descended upon all of them. And so Musa alayhi salam said, Oh Allah, allow me to know this individual. And Allah replied, No, we kept him a secret for 40 years, and he was sinning against us, so we will not expose him whilst he is doing good. And this is why from amongst the other narrations of Bani Israel is that there was a man who obeyed Allah for 20 years and then he sinned against Allah for 20 years and then he looked one day at himself and he found that he had become an old man. An old man. Half of his life was in the pleasure of Allah and his obedience and half of his life was in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he said and he made dua and he said to Allah Oh Allah, forgive me for what I have done. I repent to you and I want to rectify myself. So Allah Azza wa Jal replied to him and he said, that indeed when you obeyed me, we brought you closer to us. And when you sinned against us, we were patient with you. And if you return to us, then we will accept you. And this is a famous statement which is mentioned in many works of the scholars of Islam. That Allah Azza wa Jal repents and he accepts the repentance of those who sin. And we all know the famous story of the man who killed a hundred men from amongst the children of Israel. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal accepted his repentance. And in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned the story of another man from the children of Israel. A man who even though he didn't commit shirk with Allah, he committed each and every single type of other sin. He murdered and he stole, and he committed zina, and he drank alcohol, and he did, and he did, and he did. He did everything except commit shirk to Allah, with Allah. And so on his deathbed, when he felt that he was about to die, he gathered his children, and he said to them, what kind of a father was I to you? 
So they replied and they said, you were a good father to us. So he said, I swear by Allah that I have not done a single good deed. So when I die, take my body and light a fire and burn my body within that fire and then gather my ashes and scatter them across the world. And so they scattered them, some in the sea, some in the land and some on the mountains. They scattered them everywhere. And so Allah Azza wa Jal gathered his ashes and he asked him, what made you do what you did? What made you ask to be cremated and that your ashes to be spread out? And so he replied and he said, I did it only out of fear for you, that you would punish me because I have no good. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, I have forgiven you and you will enter paradise. This is the immense mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy that Allah azza wa jal displays for those who return to him. And when you look at the stories of the Salaf alayhi muhammadullah, the great stories of our scholars of Islam, and what's amazing about them is that you will find that there were a number of them who weren't born as scholars, because no one's born a scholar. And many of them had difficult upbringings during their youth and during their childhood. And for the first years of their lives, they sinned against Allah and they committed major sins. Yet they repented to Allah and because they repented, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only accepted their repentance, but they became great scholars of Islam. You will find when you look at the stories of the Salaf, you will find that there are stories concerning Tawbah with regards to those who repent before they even commit a sin. When the sin is first presented to them, they will repent to Allah. That, oh Allah, I don't want to enter into this sin. You will find other stories of scholars, of, of, of scholars and companions and so on and so forth repenting during the sin. That they had begun to disobey Allah and then they realized the error of their ways. So they returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will find numerous stories of scholars as well who were initially disobeying Allah, committing major sins in Islam. That they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later and Allah azza wa jal inshaAllah forgave them. From the stories that you find amongst the Salaf is the famous story of Rabi ibn Quthaym, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he was a great scholar and a great abid, a great worshipper. And so some of the people in that society, in his community, and this is something which we need to realize, in each and every single community, there are people who wish to do evil. And there are people who wish to spread evil. And there are people who want to get others to do evil. And so in his society, there were people like that as well. So they bought a woman and they said to her, we will give you 1000 dinars if you go to Rabi ibn Quthaym and he only kisses you. Just a single kiss. And we will give you 1000 dinars. So the woman went to him at a time when he was alone and there was no one around him. And she displayed herself to him, trying to seduce him. So he said to her, O oh, female slave of Allah, what would you do if at this moment in time the angel of death were to come and he was to take your soul here? What would your response be? What would your response be if at this time you were to be asked by the two angels in the grave, Munkar and Nakir? What would your response be if at this moment in time you were to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was to ask you about this? And what would your response be when you are being dragged on your face and thrown into the fire of hell? What response will you give? And so the woman, at that moment, she stopped what she was doing and she repented to Allah. And in some narrations, it is said that she later became known as the Abidatul Kufa, the worshipper of Kufa, because of the amount of repentance that she did and how much she began to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something which you will see about those who repent to Allah, those who turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that not only do they repent to Allah, but those that are around them, that sin, that make mistakes, that disobey Allah, they cause them to return to Allah and to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. It is also reported from amongst one of the other scholars of Islam, as Ibn Qudama rahimahullah mentions, that there was a man who wanted to perform zina, wal'iyadhu billah, commit fornication. And so he went to a woman and he wanted to commit this zina with her. He wanted to commit this major sin 
with her. And so she said, I will only allow you to do so if you pay me. And the man had no money. So he said to her, what do you want? So she replied, I want 100 dinars. So he had to go out and work for weeks and months in order to gather that amount. All to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he came to her once he had gathered that money. And he went to her house and he entered upon her. And he said, here is the money, I have it. And so she said, okay. And then when she invited him to her room, he fell down and he sat down. And so she said, what's wrong with you now? You've done the hard part, you've got the money. What has made you stop at this moment? And so he said, I remember just now that on one day I will have to answer for what I am about to do. And that mawqif, that standing that I will have to stand and account for this one action is so great that my legs will not allow me to move. And so he sat down. And then when the woman saw this, she also became amazed. And she said to him, that I swear by Allah, you will not leave this house until you marry me. You will not leave until you marry me. And so the man said, no, I don't want to marry you and I will leave. And so she continued to say, no, I want to marry you. So he said, if you are true in your sincere, and you're sincere in your repentance, then come to my village and seek me out. And so she went to his village, seeking him out after a few days. And he came out and he saw her. And when he saw her, he was so overcome by that incident which took place a few days away, or a few days before, that he fell down and he, he passed away at that spot. He died there and then. Due to that mawqif, due to that standing, due to remembering that Allah Azza wa Jal will one day hold him to account for that which he has done. It was reported from amongst those, from amongst the stories of the companions radiallahu anhum, that there was a companion by the name of Abu Mahjan al-Thaqafi radiallahu an, and he was from the tribe of Banu Thaqif. And he was one of those who accepted Islam during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the people of Thaqif. Yet he had one vice. He had one sin and he had one disobedient act which he could not give up. And that was the drinking of alcohol. He couldn't give it up. And so even during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even after he accepted Islam, he would continue to drink alcohol. And then during the time of the Khulafa Abu Bakr and Umar, he would continue to do so. So the Khulafa would lash him. They would punish him for drinking alcohol, as is mentioned in the Sunnah, the punishment, the Had. Yet he would still continue. So finally, they imprisoned him. They took him away and they imprisoned him. And he was one of those people who was present in the army of Al Qadisiyah. When the Muslims were fighting the Persian army, on the battlefield of Qadisiyah during the time of Umar radiallahu an, that major decisive battle. Yet because of his drinking problems, because he was someone who couldn't hold back from this alcohol, they imprisoned him even at the battle. And so he was chained and he wasn't allowed to go and fight alongside the Muslims. And the person that was guarding him was the wife of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the leader of the army, the general. And so he saw that the Muslims were fighting. And he saw at the beginning of the battle, or towards one of the stages of the battle, that the Muslims were suffering heavy losses. They were being defeated. Because the Persians had elephants that they were using to attack the Muslims. So when he saw this, he regretted that he wasn't able to participate. So he said to the wife of Sa'ad, I ask you by Allah that you allow me to go and fight. Let me join the ranks of my brothers and fight. And then if Allah Azza wa Jal decrees that I am still alive after the battle, I will come and chain myself up again in this place. And so she said, no, you can't go. And then he continued to say this, the Muslims are suffering defeats. They need their help. Allow me to go. And so eventually she agreed. So she unchained him. And she gave him the horse and the weapons of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an, because during the battle Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was ill he was unable to stand and move so he was just looking at the battlefield and he was overlooking the battle but he wasn't able to participate so she gave him his horse and she gave him his weapons 
And she said, go. And so he went out and he fought. And he killed so many of the disbelievers. And the people were amazed when they were looking at him. Who is this man that we didn't see before, yet now he has come to our aid. He has come to help us now. And so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas also saw him fighting like a brave warrior in the battlefield. And he was also amazed, who is this man that I have not seen before, yet he is fighting. So when the Muslims were granted victory on that day, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas came to his wife and he told her what he saw. And he said, I swear by Allah that if Abu Mihjan hadn't been chained, I would have thought it was Abu Mihjan. And so she mentioned to him what took place the conversation that they had, and that she allowed him to go and fight. And so he went and he said to Abu Mihjan, what took place with you? What happened to you? From one instance, you were a person who would indulge in alcohol, yet now you are a brave warrior. And so he replied, and he said that when I saw the Muslims fighting, when I saw them in that difficult situation, I regretted that which I did. And I swear by Allah that after today, I will not touch alcohol. And so he repented there. And by him, Allah Azza wa Jal gave victory to the Muslims on that day. You will find others from amongst the scholars of Islam. Alayhim rahmatullah. Scholars like the likes of Dinar al-Ayyar. Rahimahullah. And he was someone who was also, before he became a scholar, someone who would indulge in sin. And he had an elderly mother. And his mother would constantly say to him and remind him, to be fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to return to Allah azza wa jal. But Dinar al-Ayyar, he was someone who was overcome by sin, he found it difficult to leave it. Until one day he went, and he went to a graveyard. And he went to this graveyard, and looking at the graves, he saw the different graves, and he became affected by them. And as he was going through the graveyard, he saw bones that had been left that hadn't been buried. So he picked one of them up and he was overcome by this and he said to himself that one day I will also become like this. Nothing will remain of me except bones. So he went back to his mother and he told her that he had changed his way and he began to pray and he would pray so much that he wouldn't sleep during the night until his mother, the one who was telling him to fear Allah, to seek forgiveness, to make tawbah, even she became afraid and she would say to him, O oh dinar, stop what you are doing. Take a break, rest a little. You are worshipping too much, you will, have, you will overcome yourself like this. Yet dinar al-ayyar said, no. Indeed, I will continue to strive in this world so that I may seek respite and rest in the next life. Rahimahullah ta'ala. You have from amongst those people the likes of Fudayl ibn Iyad, Rahimahullah ta'ala. Fudayl ibn Iyad is one of the greatest scholars of Islam. Yet he didn't begin as a scholar of Islam. During his early years, he was a thief and he was a road bandit. And he was so severe in what he used to do. He was, the people were so scared of him that the people wouldn't travel in his area out of fear for him. Fudayl ibn Iyad. One day he was overcome by a girl that he was attracted to. And so he wanted to go and see her. So during the night he traveled to her house. And he jumped over her wall. And he heard her reciting from the Quran. Subhanallah, even when someone is making tawbah, even though you're not aware of it, Allah Azza wa Jal will cause others to be affected by that. She was reciting from the Quran, praying during the night. He went there to do evil with her. Yet she was reciting the Qur'an and praying to Allah. And from that which she was reciting was the famous verse in Surah Al-Hadid. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has not the time come for those who believe that their hearts should fear Allah? Has not the time come for those who believe that their hearts should fear Allah? So he said, قَدْ آنَ قَدْ آن. Indeed that time has come, indeed it has come. And so he left her house. And as he was walking by, there were a group of people in the middle of the night. And they were saying to one another, why don't we continue traveling this night? So another one of them said, no, indeed, this is the area of Fudayl ibn Iyad. It is not safe for us to travel here. And so he heard this, them talking about him like this. And so he was overcome by this. 
and he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he became a great scholar of Islam. And his sayings and his actions and so on and so forth are well documented in the books of the scholars alayhim rahmatullah. Another scholar like that was Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah ta'ala. Malik ibn Dinar is one of the great scholars of Islam. Yet he didn't begin that way. Malik ibn Dinar narrates his own story. And he mentions in a number of works of biography, he mentions about himself that his biggest sin that he committed was drinking alcohol. It wasn't something which he could leave. And along with that, he committed many other sins and he lists them. All of the sins that he committed. Yet he couldn't leave alcohol. That was one of the biggest vices that he had. And so Allah Azza wa Jal decreed that on, after some time he would get married. So he got married. Yet he couldn't still leave alcohol, he would still continue to drink. And then Allah Azza wa Jal decreed that he should be given a daughter. And so when he had this daughter, he, be, he fell in love with the daughter. He loved his daughter a lot, very much. And so one day he was sitting with his daughter and he was still drinking alcohol. But he was sitting with his daughter and he was about to drink from a bottle. And the daughter, his daughter took out her hand and she dropped the bottle from his hand. And so when he saw this, and he saw his daughter, and she was only young, she wasn't even able to speak. But when he saw this from his daughter, he took it as a sign that he should stop. And because of his love for her, he stopped drinking as well. But after some time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that his daughter should pass away. And she died at a very young age. Soon after this, she died. And so he was so overcome by grief, by sadness. He was so depressed that he had no other way. He couldn't think of anything else except to go back to drinking. So that night he drank and he drank and he drank until he passed out from being drunk. He drank so much that he fainted, he passed out. And during that night he saw a dream. And he says that I saw that I was standing on Yawmul Qiyamah amongst all of the people there. And I saw that there was a big snake, a serpent, that was searching for me between the people. And he was chasing me. So I turned around and I began to run. And I could see that the snake was gaining on me. It was about to come to me and catch me and take me. So as I was running, I came across an old man who had a beautiful appearance. An old man. So I came to him and I said, save me or help me. So the man said, as for saving you, then I cannot do so. But as for helping you, then try to go this way. And so he says, I continued to run in that direction until I came to the edge of the land. I came to the edge and when I looked over, I saw the fire. And so I was terrified, I thought I would fall in. And then I heard a voice of someone saying, indeed that is not for you. So I turned back and I continued to run and the serpent was still chasing me. And I went back and I found that same old man there. So I said to him, I ask you by Allah, either save me or give me some help. So the man replied, as for saving you, I cannot do so. But as for helping you, then try to go in this direction. So he went running to that direction until he finally came to a palace or a house. And in that palace, he saw from amongst the people there his own daughter. So he says, my daughter came to me and she slapped me on my face and on my chest. And she said, oh, my father, indeed, you will fall into the fire of hell if you do not stop what you are doing. So he says to her, what is going on? What is this that I see? So she says, as for that serpent, that snake that is chasing you, it is all of your evil deeds. Everything which you have done in disobedience to Allah. And it is so powerful that it is about to gain you, to grab hold of you and to overcome you. And as for that old man that you see on the way, he is your good deeds. But he is so weak because you have so few good deeds. He is so weak and so powerless. He is unable to help you or protect you. He is unable to do anything. So if you do not change what you are doing, then you will be overcome by the fire. And then she recited that verse to him again. Alam amanu an Has not the time come? Has not the time come for those who have iman, for those who believe that their heart should fear Allah? And so he awoke and he said, قد آن قد آن. That time has come, that time has come. And he repented to Allah. And he became a great scholar of Islam. That same scholar, Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah, a few years later, after he has changed, 
repented to Allah, turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was praying in his home during one night. And he heard someone entering into his house, a burglar, someone who wanted to come in. And so he quickly finished his prayer and he turned around and he saw the thief there. So he said to him, what do you want? So the man said that I came to your house to steal from you, but you have nothing in your house. You don't have a single thing. There's nothing to take from you. And so the man, so Malik ibn Dina rahimahullah, he replied and he said, but don't leave empty handed. I will give you something better than that which you came to seek. I will give you a treasure better than that which you came to seek. So he went and he bought some water. And he said, make wudu and pray two rak'ahs with me. That is better for you than that which you came to take from me. So the man, he performed wudu. He's a thief. He's a burglar. He's come to harm him. He performs wudu. And he prays two rak'ahs with Malik ibn Dinar, rahimahullah. So Malik ibn Dinar, after he finishes praying, he says, you are free to go. So the man says, no, I want to pray two more. So he prays two more with Malik ibn Dinar. And then after those two, he says, you are free to go. So he says, oh Malik, allow me to stay with you this night and pray. So he continues to pray with him that whole night. And then in the morning, the man wants to leave. Uh, Malik ibn Dinar says to him, you are free to leave. So the man says, no, I have made the intention to fast on this day. And I want to spend it with you. And so Malik said to him, you are free to stay with me so long as you wish. So he spent the next few days fasting during the day, praying during the night with Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah ta'ala. And then he finally left him as a reformed individual, having repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, the repentance of Allah azza wa jal is amazing. The one who truly turns back to Allah, having left his sin, having truly feeling, felt remorse for his sin, having made a sincere intention not to return to that sin, having returned the rights of others to those that it belongs to. If a person returns to Allah and makes tawbah to Allah, then Allah Azza wa Jal will accept them. وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ عَنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَعْفُ عَنِ السَّيِّئَاتِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ It is He Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that accepts the repentance of His slaves and He forgives them for their mistakes, for their evil sins. And He knows that which you do. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in another verse, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Those who when they perform an evil act or they oppress themselves, they remember Allah. So they seek forgiveness from Allah and who is there that will forgive the sins other than Allah? And they don't continue to perform those sins whilst having knowledge of this. أُولَٰئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ The reward of those people who return to Allah is that Allah will grant them His forgiveness. And He will enter them into gardens of paradise under which rivers flow. And what a beautiful reward there is for those who act. For those who return to Allah. For those who seek repentance from Allah and seek His forgiveness, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to leave you with one final story. It is mentioned from Dhul Qarnain, from the stories that are mentioned concerning him, as is mentioned in a number of works of the scholars, alayhim rahmatullah. Dhul Qarnain, the one who is mentioned at the end of Surah Al Kahf, and some of the scholars dispute whether he was a righteous king or a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhul Qarnain, it is said that from one of the places that he visited, whilst he was traveling from the east to the west, he came upon a place and he visited one land. And he saw from amongst the people that there were people who had nobility in them. So he asked them concerning their land, concerning their heritage and history. And in other narrations it is said that Dhul Qarnain, whenever he would visit a place, he would learn about the people before he conquered them. He would learn about them first. So he asked them about them and he found that there was a lineage, a line of kings that they had that were noble kings. Kings that were powerful, that were noble, that were honorable. And so he said to the people, is there any of their descendants left? Is there anyone left amongst you who is a descendant from them? So they said yes, but you will not find him here 
because he spends all of his time in the graveyard. He spends his time in the graveyard. And this is something which our Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do, recommended for us, that we visit graveyards because they will remind us of death and that will spare us to seek forgiveness from Allah and to repent to Him. So they said, you will only find him in the graveyard. So he came to this man in the graveyard and he said to him, what is it that you're doing? What is it that you're doing in this graveyard? Why do you spend so much time here? He said that some time ago, in this graveyard, there was a flood. And so all of the bones that were within the graves, they all came out. They all appeared. And I was looking at these bones one day, trying to differentiate which one belonged to my ancestors, the noble line of kings, and which one belonged to anyone else. Yet I was unable to see the difference. The bones looked the same to me. I couldn't tell who was a king from these bones and who was a slave. And so I realized that kingdom is something which will not last. And so I spend my time here reflecting upon this, pondering over this. So Dhul Qarnayn said to him, What do you want from me? How can I help you? So he said, I have three things. If you can give them to me, then I will be satisfied. I want a life which will never end in death. And I want youth that will never be overcome by old age. And I want wealth which will never be followed by poverty. Life that never ends in death. Youth that is never overcome by old age and wealth which is never followed by poverty. And so Dhul Qarnayn replied to him and he said, as for these three, I am unable to give them to you. I am unable to guarantee them for you. So the man replied, he said, in that case, there is nothing you can give to me. Leave me alone. And subhanAllah, this story is powerful because it shows the end result of each and every single one of us. When we pass away and we enter into our graves, the bones and the remnants that will remain, it won't matter whether you were a king in this life or whether you were a slave. It won't matter whether, whether you were a scholar in this life or whether you were a layman. None of that will matter. What will matter is how Allah Azza wa Jal views you. You're standing in the sight of Allah. Whether Allah Azza wa Jal accepts your good deeds, whether He accepts your repentance of your evil deeds, or whether He chooses to punish us for that which we have done. This is something which we need to reflect on. And one of the best ways to reflect upon this is to look at the lives of our scholars, alayhim rahmatullah. Because even though they were great scholars of Islam, many of them committed sins. All of them committed sins. And many of their stories are narrated to us, they're mentioned to us, and how they repented to Allah, and how Allah Azza wa Jal forgave them, inshaAllah, and how their end outcome was. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grants us the ability to make tawbah to Him to repent for our sins. And that he forgives us for all of our sins, that which is apparent, that which is hidden, that which is major and that which is minor. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gathers us all on Yawm Al-Qiyamah under the shade of his throne. That he grants us his mercy, that he enters us into his paradise. في مقعد صدق عند مليك مقتدر هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.